Hey everybody, so um, I'm going to continue where I left off. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Father God, I ask for your presence and that you lead me and guide me as I read your word in interpretation that I correctly speak your words and that I'm able to get true meaning across to everyone who hears this that our eyes and our ears are open and that that you would instill whatever understanding that you would like for us to know in Jesus mighty name amen so uh, 1st Corinthians chapter 6 it's lawsuit among believers if any of you has a dispute with another do you dare to take it before the ungodly for judgment instead of before the Lord's people? Or do you not know that the Lord's people will judge the world? And if you are to judge the world, are you not competent to judge trivial cases? Do you not know that we will judge angels how much more the things of this life? So if, if we're, as believers, we're, we're going to be put in a position that, that we're going to be asked to judge angels. And I, I want you to understand, at least from my understanding, um, angels are no different than we are. They're servants of the Lord. They're servants of the Lord. You, you see it in the book of Revelations that, that the, the angels are constantly telling John, don't worship us, don't worship us. We're servants just like you are. So it, what, what it appears that this is trying to teach us is there's, there's another verse that, that comes to mind. Um, take the plank out of your own eye before you try to take the splinter out of your brother's eye. You know, um, if, you, if, you, if you come to the Lord with gifts, uh, leave your gifts at the altar if you have, if you have uh, a dispute going on with your brother and, and then come back with the gifts for the Lord once that dispute is settled. The Lord is telling us these things throughout the Bible. That disputes should be handled, and, and honestly, they should be handled immediately. What is actually, what is a dispute? It's a misunderstanding when the ego gets involved. When the ego gets involved and the problem is that the ego is so involved that people refuse to take responsibility for their actions people refuse to apologize for the wrong things that they do disputes could be over within minutes on the other side of that it's also ego that gets their feelings hurt So these trivial things that happen on a daily basis, how many times a day do we get our feelings hurt? And these things, these things can be over and done with. Uh, misunderstandings happen all the time. But here's the other thing. Um, wh what it says in here, if any of you had to dispute with another, do you dare to take it before ungodly for judgment instead of before the Lord's people? So we dare to take it to the, the world's court system who are non-believers. You're going to be judged according to the world's standards, not by God's standards. But this is what happens because not everyone that calls themselves a Christian is a true Christian. This is, this is what is going on out here. And the world has been brought into Christianity. And it's no different today than it was back in the day right after Jesus ascended. <coughs> because all of those people over there, they were all doing the occult and mysticism and witchcraft. So it is no different today as it was back then. So here we are. We're in the same situation. And because it's very evident that we can see that we're in the end times, the church has to finally... Uh, take a stand 
the church has to really start getting serious about walking with Christ and following the commands of the Bible. You see, and um, no, we've, we've been told, we've been told through the book of Revelation that uh, Jezebel is all up in that church. And it's the truth. People don't want to hear it, but it's the truth. So, so what do we do? Um, we have to continuously teach the gospel. We have to continuously teach the gospel. People have to know what God wants from us. Otherwise, they don't know. And people have to be taught in the church that they should read the Bible. <coughs> Not that... Not that it's your choice. You can read the Bible if you want to. No, no, no. If you're a Christian, you should be reading the Bible every single day. Things have to change. Things really have to change. So how do we handle disputes? Well, Christians don't know how to handle disputes because all we know is what the world has taught us. And uh, the world is Satan's playground. It, the, the Satan doesn't want us to handle dispute amicably. So, uh, as I've been telling you, everything we've learned goes exactly opposite of God's word. And so here we go again. If any of you has a dispute with another, do you dare take it before the ungodly for judgment? Do you dare take it before the ungodly for judgment? Instead of before the Lord's people. Or do you not know that the Lord's people will judge the world? And if you are to judge the world, are you not competent to judge trivial cases? Understand those words are very important. You are going to judge the world. Hear how many times that word world is listed in this Bible. It was no mistake that Jesus used that word, that word, be in the world, but not of the world. Because understand, now take notice of it, how often you see that word world in this Bible and how we must transcend it, overcome it, um, reject it. Um, now it's saying we will judge the world. Oh, and we will. Because the world... Is Satan's world and it's all non-believers we will be judging that world you must work diligently to transcend that world so are you not competent to judge trivial cases well uh, until you transcend the world no you're not because you're a part of the world you think like the world you behave like the world so this is why, another reason why, you must work diligently to transcend the world. Do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more the things of this life? Therefore, if you have disputes about such matters, do you ask for a ruling from those whose way of life is scorned by the church? And if you think about it, this is exactly what we're doing. But in the same respect, this is exactly how the majority of Christians are living. We're living like the people who are scorned by the church. This is what the sleep is. Calling yourself a Christian, yet being of the world. This is exactly what the sleep is. I say this to shame you. Is it possible that there is nobody among you wise enough to judge a dispute between believers? How hard is it? How hard is it to say, you hurt my feelings. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to hurt your feelings. What I meant was this. How hard was that? Oh, man, how hard was that? But for some people, it's worse than being killed is to say, I'm sorry. And yet they still want to call themselves a Christian. But instead, one brother takes another to court. 
And, and this in front of unbelievers. The very fact that you have lawsuits among you means you have been completely defeated already. You have been completely defeated already. You are still following Satan. This is exactly what he's saying. You are still following Satan. You are of Satan's world. And you are following Satan's ways. You are defeated already. Which is why you are having a dispute to begin with. Because you're living by your ego and by the personhood. Everything is personal to you. And the only person that you care about is yourself. So you've been defeated already. And you all have to understand that. This is the importance and the urgency of you waking up out of the sleep and transcending the world. The very fact that you have lawsuits among you means... You have been completely defeated already. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? Instead, you yourselves cheat and do wrong. And you do this to your brothers and sisters. Or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Sexual immorality. I have the right to do anything you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have a right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. You say, food for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy them both. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. By this power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he will raise us also. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her body for it is said the two will become one flesh and I have literally explained this to you guys that the act of sexual intercourse creates one unit one physical unit remember we are energy beings we are spiritual beings we are not solely these bodies these bodies are our houses we are energy and spiritual beings when during sexual intercourse, this body becomes, and the, and the person you're having sex with becomes one unit. And you are sharing every single demon with each other during intercourse. So, if you have sex with a prostitute, you're having sex with every demon that she has in her system. She has also shared demons with every person who she has slept with so you really have to think about that this is how people can have two and three hundred demons in them it is that easy it is that easy do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her body for it is said the two will become one flesh and that is in fact truth but whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit flee from sexual immorality all other sins a person commits are outside the body 
But whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you? Whom you have received from God. You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. See, at least for me, I can only speak for myself. These things were never explained to me like this. And of course, I never read the Bible. Um, we really have to know the truth about why God is telling us these things. And, and you know, you, we're always thinking because we're of the world and we're in the sleep. And when we're younger, we're thinking we want to go out and party. Well, this is what everyone else is doing. Why, why, am I, why do I have to be stopped from doing this? We don't understand the reasons why we're being told it is for our own benefit. It's because God loves us. It's, it's not to stop us or to punish us or to stop us from living our life. The complete opposite, the abundance of life that we will have without all this sin, without all these demons in us. And we're, we're not even aware of all these demons. Most of us, we're not even aware of all these demons. We are not aware of how we are destroying ourselves by living of the world this is why jesus told us to be in the world and not of the world chapter seven concerning married life now for matters you wrote about it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman but since sexual immorality is occurring each man should have sexual relations with his own wife and each woman with her own husband. The husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife, and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but yields it to her husband. In the same way, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but yields it to his wife. You see, and the problem with, with us, even while we're married, um, well, we also have the problem of adultery on either side. Women, women do adultery too. So we have the problem of adultery if, there, if there's not a monogamous relationship. And you're bringing sin into your marriage. You're bringing demons into your marriage. You're bringing STDs into your marriage. Um, the other thing is, we're, we're not aware of our spiritual selves. And the act of, of sexual intercourse is a spiritual thing. When two people are married and having sexual intercourse, once again, that same scenario is true. The body becomes one circuit, one flesh. All of the electricity, the vibration, and the spiritual self become in oneness with the Lord. This is what happens. See, tantrics try to take that same scenario the relationship between a husband and wife the sexual um the sexual relations between a husband and a wife and they try to relay that to tantric sex and they're they're sleeping with hundreds of people it it you have to understand the whole demon aspect of all of this the whole sin of fornication you will never ever ever reach enlightenment through tantric sex ever it is a lie from hell it is a lie from hell in fact in a marriage the act of sexual intercourse is a spiritual act if the if the married couple are spiritual beings they will be able to understand this it is a spiritual act and they will in fact they become one flesh they will become one spirit with the lord Absolutely. The wife does not have authority over her own body and neither does the husband. This, this whole act of being spiteful and withholding sex, that is done on both sides by male and female. That also is of the world. It, it is not respecting the marriage itself. It is not respecting the partner. It is not respecting your vows. It is not respecting anything. It is selfishness. It is ego. It is of the world. Okay? 
do not deprive each other except perhaps by mutual consent for a time so that you may devote yourselves to prayer sometimes people will instead of fasting food they will be celibate for a short time um, while they pray if they if they're both in agreement on that one person can't say i want to be celibate for a week or 21 days because i'm going to pray and, and the, the husband or the wife did not consent or agree to that that that's not acceptable both partners have to be okay with it you can't do anything like that uh, against your your partner's will you can't because you've entered into a covenant with that person so as long as the the other spouse agrees to it then you can do that for a short time So there must be mutual consent and for a time so that you may devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. So once, if, if, you, if you decide to be celibate for prayer, then they're telling you to actually go ahead and be intimate with each other so that you're not tempted outside of the marriage. That's, that's what he's saying. You do not want to be tempted outside of the marriage. You take care of everything that's needed to be taken care of within that covenant of your marriage. I say this as a concession, not as a command. Because overall, the best thing is to be a celibate. I wish that all of you were as I am, but each of you has your own gift from God. One has this gift, another has that. Now to the unmarried and the widows, I say, it is good for them to stay unmarried as I do. But if they cannot control themselves, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. To the married, I give this command. Not I, but the Lord. A wife must not separate from her husband. But if she does, she must remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. And a husband must not divorce his wife. To the rest I say this, I, not the Lord. If any brother has a wife who is not a believer and she is willing to live with him, he must not divorce her. So, if, if you get saved... Let's say you both were in the mystics community or in New Age and one of you gets saved and the other of the other of you did, did not get saved. You still want to pray to demons. Um, what the Bible is saying is that you should not throw that person away. Why? Because God can work miracles in anyone's life. We have to understand that. So if a brother has a wife who is not a believer and she is willing to live with him, he must not divorce her. And if a woman has a husband who is not a believer and he is willing to live with her, she must not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband has been sanctified through his wife and the unbelieving wife has been sanctified through her believing husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean. But as it is, they are holy. But if the unbeliever leaves, let it be so. The brother or the sister is not bound in such circumstances. God has called us to live in peace. So if you become a believer and your, your other half is not, you should not initiate a divorce as a believer. But if they, the unbeliever, decide that they want a divorce and they want to leave, then, then you have God's blessings. Because you didn't initiate it. And overall, there should be peace for everybody. How do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? See, anything can happen. Concerning change of status. Nevertheless, each person, each person should live as a believer in whatever situation the Lord has assigned to them. Just as God has called them, this is, this is the rule I laid down in all the churches. 
was a man already circumcised when he was called, he should not become uncircumcised. Was a man uncircumcised when he was called, he should not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing. Keeping God's commands is what counts. Keeping God's commands is what counts. It's not about rituals. It's not about religious anything. This is why we must all transcend religion. As I told you guys right from the beginning, religion is man-made and it was created in Satan's kingdom. Which is why it's imperative that every single one of us read the Bible, know God's word, and internalize it. And this is what is being said here. Keeping God's commands is what counts. So if you go to church every week, even if you volunteer at the church, um, do whatever the church asks you, but you're, you're at home, you're beating up your wife, or you're cheating on your wife, or you're embezzling money on your job, or whatever, whatever, whatever. It doesn't matter how many times you go to church and how you're keeping the rituals of your church. You're not keeping God's commands. That is the only thing that matters. That is the only thing that matters. Which is why I say, don't listen for Bible thumpers. Don't listen for Bible thumpers. The way you can see a true follower of Christ is understand how they treat people. When you see a person, how they treat people, if they treat people well, you understand they know the Word of God and they are practicing the Word of God. That's what you should be looking for. Not, not how many Bible verses they're, they're quoting to you. Each person should remain in the situation they were in when God called them. Were you a slave when you were called? Don't let it trouble you. Although if you can gain your freedom, do so. For the one who was a slave when called to faith in the Lord is the Lord's freed person. Similarly, the one who was free when called is Christ's slave. You were bought at a price. Do not become slaves of human beings. See, we should never, ever, ever, ever idolize anybody out here. This is all idolatry. And that includes idolizing our own selves. Thinking that we are so wonderful, that we are so holy, we are magnanimous, we've got millions of people following us, we're all that. This is idolatry before the Lord. We have, to, we have to transcend all of it and chop down that ego every single second that you can chop down that ego. So for the one who was a slave when called to faith in the Lord is the Lord's freed person. Similarly, the one who was free when called is Christ's slave. And understand the distinction there. For the one who is a slave when called to faith in the Lord is the Lord's freed person. Do you understand? When, you, when you're when you a slave to the world and, and, and you're, you're going through all of this suffering, wh whether it be um, physical, mental, financial, you're going through all this suffering and finally you get freedom when you're saved through Jesus Christ. You feel that freedom. You feel all of that, that heaviness lift off you. You're Christ's freed person. You don't have to be told that you're a slave to Christ. You will do anything the Lord wants you to do because you're so grateful for everything that you've been delivered from, that the Lord has, has helped you, has healed you, has delivered you. You are so grateful you will do anything for the Lord. Contrarily, if you hadn't had much much uh, suffering out in the world, you, you, had, you were wealthy, you had anything you wanted out there, but all of a sudden you've had this conviction now you were saved. You must know that you are a slave to God. You are a slave to Christ now. You are not free to do whatever you want. Because you had not felt suffering like the other person did, you may feel that that this uh, being saved by Christ is, is just something else that you're, you're going through and you own it. No, no, you must know you are a slave to Christ. You are not your own person. Okay? Where the one who was a slave out in the world, 
They are so thankful. They don't want to look anywhere else. It, it, it's God or bust. And that, that is exactly who I was. You see, I never had it good out in the world. So when I was saved by God, it, it's God or bust. I do whatever I'm told. I don't have to be told I'm a slave to Christ because that's all I know is Christ. That's all I live for is Christ. You understand? With a person who has not had it bad out in the world, they need to understand that once they are committed to Christ and they say that they are saved to Christ, they are Christ's slave. They are no longer their own person. They have been bought with a price and they must understand that. They're no longer of the world and they should not live as they are of the world. They should not behave as they are of the world. That's the difference there. You were bought at a price. Do not become slaves of human beings. You do not worship or idolize anybody out here. Nobody. Nobody, nobody, nobody. Brothers and sisters, each person as responsible to God should remain in the situation they were in when God called them. Concerning the unmarried, now about virgins, I have no command from the Lord, but I give a judgment as one who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. Because of the present crisis, I think that it is good for a man to remain as he is. Are you pledged to a woman? Do not seek to be released. Are you free from such a commitment? Do not look for a wife. But if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. But those who marry will face many troubles in this life. And I want to spare you this. They are actually encouraging. The Bible is actually encouraging people not to get married. They are encouraging people to stay single and be celibate. That is, in fact, what the Bible is encouraging. What I mean, brothers and sisters, is that the time is short. From now on, those who have wives should live as if they do not. Those who mourn as if they did not. Those who are happy as if they were not. Those who buy something as if it were not theirs to keep. Transcend the world break all attachments. Do you understand? Right in that one little paragraph is everything I've been saying out here. I'm going to read that again. What I mean, brothers and sisters, is that the time is short. From now on, those who have wives should live as if they do not. You break that attachment. He's not saying to leave your wife. He's saying break that attachment. Those who mourn as if they did not break that attachment. So if your wife dies, it's not going to destroy your life. It's not going to destroy your life. You are still one in Christ. Break every attachment. Those who are happy as if they were not, do not be attached to your emotions. Emotions are in the personhood. Emotions are in the personhood. Emotions are controlled by these demons. When you are in the oneness space, you are actually in a neutral space. I've also explained this to you. You are neither happy nor sad. You are in a neutral space. It's exactly what they're saying here. Praise God. Praise God. And I was called a demon and a witch over, the, over my teachings. And here it is right here in the Bible. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory be to God. Those who buy something as if it were not theirs to keep, you have no attachments. You have no desires. If you want to get something, you get it because you like it. You don't desperately need it. You're not going to die if you don't have it. And you're not going to die if you lose it. This is exactly what he's saying here. Those who use the things of the world as if not engrossed in them, no attachments, no desires. For this world in its present form is passing away. I would like you to be free from concern. An unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs. How can he please the Lord? 
But a married man is concerned about the affairs of this world. How can he please his wife? It's very, very simple, you guys. I really have made it as simple as possible for you. You must know what the concepts are. You must break every attachment and you must break every desire. You must transcend every desire. Which means for a short time, you're going to have to remove yourself from the world. There's things that you're going to want in this world that you're going to have to just say no and let yourself feel that pain and feel that hurt and feel that anger that you're not having it and it'll pass. You will see that it will pass and the fact that it has passed, you know that it's temporary and therefore it is of the personhood. This is the realm where the demons possess or not possess but demonize. Um, your attachments, it, it's, it doesn't mean you stop loving your wife or you stop loving your children or your pets or whatever. It only means that you break that attachment to them. You, you truly learn how to have true love. True love. Meaning they're here, to, they're here also to learn how to break their attachments and how to transcend the world for themselves as well. And once these attachments are broken, you can't hurt each other's feelings anymore. There is no spite work anymore. There is no one-upping each other anymore. There is no controlling each other anymore. Everyone lives in harmony with each other. This is the beauty of it. And when you're, when you're living of the world, this seems like torture in the beginning. And it almost is. It almost feels like it is. But once you master it and you break the attachments and you break the desires, transcend it, you will see the beauty that God has promised us. It truly is here. It truly is here. This is what he's talking about here. There's no mistake that I was led to this book to start off my Bible studies, you guys. God is so good. I, 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 I want to jump out of my skin. I, 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 can't even, I don't even have the words for this. But a man is concerned about the affairs of this world, how he can please his wife, and his interests are divided. An unmarried woman or virgin is concerned about the Lord's affairs. Her aim is to be devoted to the Lord in both body and spirit. But a married woman is concerned about the affairs of this world, how she can please her husband. I am saying this for your own good, not to restrict you but that you may live in a right way, undivided devotion to the Lord. And that is what I was saying to you, that once you transcend the world, everything, you come from the heart space now. Instead of coming from the head, when you live, in, when you live of the world, you are coming from the head. When you transcend the world, you come from the heart, which is where God lives. And everything you do stems from this place, because the Lord comes first in everything. And this is exactly what he's saying in here. So I am saying this for your own good, not to restrict you, but that you may live in a right way in undivided devotion to the Lord. If anyone is worried that he might not be acting honorably toward the virgin he is engaged to, and if his passions are too strong, too strong and he feels that he ought to marry, he should do as he wants. He is not sinning. They should get married. You should not have sex before marriage. But if you feel like you, you can't transcend the lust of the body or the hormones of the body and you're engaged, you're due to get married, then you should marry. He's not telling you to make yourself suffer. It's not what it's all about. If you're engaged to be married, then go ahead and get married. But the man who has settled the matter in his own mind, who is under no compulsion, but has control over his own will, and who has made up his mind not to marry the virgin, this man also does the right thing. So then, he who marries the virgin does right, but he who does not marry the virgin does better. 
because he who marries the virgin, you will you will be focused on the world instead of on God. And then somewhere down the line, you will be called to wake up and you'll have to go through this whole process after you've had a lifetime of suffering because no one teaches no one teaches uh, young people w what this is all about, how to transcend the world. No one teaches young people all this stuff. Why? Because the world is asleep. The world is asleep. But the man who has settled the matter in his own mind, when you get to a place where I got, where it was God or bust, where it was God or bust, I'm telling you, it is possible, it is possible to transcend the hormones of the body. It is possible. I've done it. I've done it. So when you make up your own mind and your will is strong enough that the only thing you want in life is God, everything is possible. And your whole world changes. You have nothing else tying you down. Nothing else. So then he who marries the virgin does right, but he who does not marry her does better. A woman is bound to her husband as long as he lives, but if her husband dies, she is free to marry anyone she wishes, but he must belong to the Lord. She must marry another believer. In my judgment, she is happier if she stays as she is, and I think that too, I think that I too have the Spirit of God. So he's saying she will be happy as long as you are married, you are living of the world. And we all have to understand this. It's very hard unless both of you are on a very serious spiritual path and you've both decided that it's God or bust and you want to transcend the world and you want to do it together and be a support for each other. It is absolutely possible to do this and transcend the world. For most people, um, the, the, the two spouses are usually not identically on the path at the same place we're on spectrums we're on spectrums one person is absolutely more serious than their spouse um, it's very rare to have two people at the same place that are in the place where they say it's God or bust so once you're married um, and of course that other person if they're not in that place to say it's God or bust it's gonna want sex so when you're trying to transcend the hormones and the lust you're obligated to that person if they're not willing to transcend the hormones of the body, you're obligated to have sexual intercourse with that person through your marriage vows. So there, there lies the problem. And you wind up remaining of the world because that lust is so powerful. As you understand, most of the things that the Bible speaks about is lust, is fornication, is adultery. This, these sex hormones drive people to do crazy things. This is one of the hardest things to overcome and transcend. But when your mind and your will is set on God and you don't have any other person that, that you're dealing with, any spouse that you're dealing with, then you are free to only focus on God. That's what he was saying in here. I'm going to see if I can get another chapter in here because it's going pretty fast. Concerning food sanctified to idols. Now about food sanctified to idols. We know that we all possess knowledge, but knowledge puffs up while love builds up. Knowledge is for the ignorant. Who are the ignorant? They're not stupid people. The ignorant are the sleepers. The ignorant are the people who have not woken up yet. So they don't know the truth. So because they don't know the truth, they are seeking knowledge. So knowledge is for the ignorant. And what happens? The more knowledge one gets in the sleep, the more it puffs up their, it puffs up their ego. They believe that they are this know-it-all, intelligent, whoever. So it puffs them up. Okay? We all possess knowledge. But knowledge puffs up while love builds up. 
Those who think they know something do not yet know as they ought to know. There you go, in a nutshell. Those who think they know something do not yet know as they ought to know because you have not seen the truth yet. You have not woken up yet. But whoever loves God is known by God. So then, about eating food sac sanctified to idols, we know that an idol is nothing at all in the world and that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things come and for whom we live, and there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things come and through whom we live. But not everyone possesses this knowledge. Some people are still so accustomed to idols that when they eat sa sacrificial food, they think of it as having been sacrificed to a god. And since their conscience is weak, it is deified. But food does not bring us near to God. We are no worse if we do not eat and no better if we do. Be careful, however, that the exercise of your rights does not become a stumbling block to the weak. For if someone with a weak conscience sees you with all of your knowledge eating in an idol's temple, won't that person be emboldened to eat what is, what is sacrificed to idols? So this weak brother or sister for whom Christ died is destroyed by your knowledge. When you sin against them in this way and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if what I eat causes my brother or sister to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again so that I will not cause them to fall. So what he's saying, because I, I know this is, um, there's, there's another place in the, in the, in the Bible where it talks about that we should eat. I think it was in Genesis where it says that we should eat, um, everything that the Lord has put before us. Um, it's all, it's all blessed for us that we should eat everything. So that included meat. Um, and then it talked about the people who are weak, who only eat vegetables um, I've had that discussion with you. What he's saying is, if there is uh, uh, someone who is new to to the faith and they see him um, sacrificing an animal to a god or near a temple of a god and they believe that they are sacrificing that animal for that god and then that meat is holy, then we are literally destroying that person we are, we are literally causing a sin against Christ to do that. Of course, we don't have that, that same problem today. Nobody's sacrificing animals to a God, um, at least not in America. But we have to be careful. People who are new in the faith are looking to, especially pastors, leaders of churches, but also everyday people that they meet on the street that... that identify themselves as Christians. People who are new to the faith look to see how these Christians are behaving and acting and what they're doing, how they're speaking, how they're treating people to get an understanding of how they should behave. Do you understand? When you mislead a, 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 a young person in Christ, you are sinning against Christ. You are sinning against Christ. And your part in the in the in the in the body of Christ should be taken very seriously. And this is the problem that people are facing, battling their egos and being of the world. This is a major spiritual battle out here that most people don't even realize. I don't believe many pastors even realize the kind of spiritual battle that they're in. Um, they know they're in some kind of spiritual battle. I don't think they understand how serious a spiritual battle it is. So I want you to understand that every single thing that I have ever spoken about out here has now been 
read to you from the Bible. And I have been vilified and attacked and abused and called a witch and a demon only from the ignorance of these sleepers out here. And this is the damage that these people can do when they don't take their positions in the church seriously and they let their egos run away with them. So they have, in fact, idolized themselves that they stood in judgment of me when, in fact, I was the one who has actually transcended the world. And this is what I have been saying out here. Now, once again, I'm going to point out to you what you believe in the sleep is the exact opposite of God's word. I will continuously say this to you because the more you hear it, the more it will sink in. That everything I have ever shared out here with you is in this Bible because there's only one truth. Okay? There's only one truth. And if you're serious on a path, celibacy is, is what you need to strive for. No masturbation. Masturbation calls in these demons. There's actually, I believe, a spirit of masturbation. So if, if you're having a problem with masturbation, look to get some deliverance from it. That will help you with your celibacy. But it is possible to transcend the hormones of the body without even being delivered from a spirit of masturbation. I've done it. I've done it. Even before I even came back to the Bible and, and knew about all these demons, I transcended the hormones of the body while I was being sexually attacked by this demon here. So I had this demon touching me in the genital area and every single time it touched me, I was praying to God. I was calling to God. I was covering myself in the blood of Jesus. I was calling on the angels every single time. This was how I transcended the hormones of the body. It absolutely can be done. I've done it. Okay? So we got three chapters in today. That was good. And um, listen to it over and over again, you guys. You cannot listen to these things once. You have got to internalize these words. The Bible is known as the sword of the spirit. This is how you are going to cut through the delusion of the sleep, of the devil's lies, of the world. This is how you are going to transcend the world, is by knowing what is in this Bible and internalizing it, becoming it. This is why I say this prayer before I do any of these Bible studies, that, we, that our eyes and our ears would be open, that we would be able to internalize his word and be able to become his word. Head knowledge is knowledge. Head knowledge. Knowledge is for the ignorant, is for the sleepers. Love. I want to get his exact words. Love is what builds up. You become it. You become it, and then you live it. And every single thing you do stems from the heart space because God comes first always. And everything springs from God. Your whole way of life changes. Your whole way of thinking changes. You all have a blessed day.